Um, so I, I, I would also like to apologize for not being there in person. I really would have liked to. I, I love visiting Vienna. It's my uh, one of my very favorite uh, cities on the planet. And um, I wish I were there, but I'm not. So uh, please feel free to interrupt me uh, with any questions or, or comments as I go. Um, I'll try to be present as much as possible uh, through this mediated technology. So um, I think everyone here is very familiar with the uh, issue of, oh, uh, just one question, I guess. Are, in seeing my slides, are you also seeing these Zoom windows or are those uh, not? present. We are seeing you. We are seeing you on the screen and we're seeing your slide. Okay. I guess that works. It works. Um, it works. Okay. So um, I think we're all kind of familiar with uh, the the fears that uh, that have been so widely talked about, about uh, the uh, in incredible advancement of AI technology in the last uh, um, 10 to 15 years, uh, things like the runaway super intelligence will sideline humans, AIs will take over human decision-making, et cetera. Um, and the frustration that we have with the meager mitigations that we have, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why these are um, really rather difficult and sometimes completely ineffective. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, these two particular pieces of artwork on, that are on the screen. These are AI-generated artworks. Uh, the one at the bottom is, is really quite a spectacular piece. Uh, I recommend having a look at it online. Um, it won first place in an art contest at a Colorado State Fair just this year. And um, interestingly enough, if you find the image online, it is labeled as being in the public domain because um, it was created by an AI and um, a copyright must be held by a human. It cannot be held by a machine. And uh, so as a consequence, this is a public domain image. Um, I, I thought that was an interesting twist, uh, but one of the things that I would like to address is the fundamental question of accountability. Um, and this is a question that is usually posed in the context of um, of things that an AI may do that may, might be damaging. So the question is, you know, is one of who bears the blame for so when something goes wrong. Uh, but I think the question of accountability can be asked in a less uh, value-laden way by focusing on who bears the credit when an AI does something uh, that that appeals to many people. Um, it's really the accountability question is the same in both cases, whether you're talking about blame or credit. And uh, I, I'll focus a little more on the credit side, uh, but I, I'd like to lay some groundwork first um, and point out that I, I'm really, my focus here is not on the kind of doomsday scenarios that are presented in um, these are five books, for example, that I have read recently that, uh, that really talk about our annihilation and, uh, the sort of, uh, singularity where there's this runaway development of super intelligence. Um, my take on what's happening is a little bit different, which is that we're not being annihilated, uh, but we are being changed as humans. And in fact, we are co-evolving with the technology. And I think that one of the things that um, bothers me about these doomsday scenarios is that they present, they talk about a future technology in the context of today's culture. And that's not what's gonna happen. Um, the future technology is going to exist in a future culture and We've seen culture change very dramatically in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, it's a little hard when you're enmeshed in it to perceive that change, uh, but it's, there have been really some very dramatic changes in our culture in this very short period of time. And 
it's um, it's showing no signs of slowing down. So let me address the essential question in my title. Uh, you know, the title is "Are we in control?" And um, first of all, what do we mean by "we" in this case? Do we mean humanity, all eight billion of us? Um, it turns out that uh, the forecast is that the population on the planet will actually hit eight billion in um, in three months in November of 2022, and so. I think the idea that 8 billion people can control anything is patently absurd. And so I think we can just set that one aside and, and not worry so much about it. Um, so what, what do we mean by we in this question? Well, uh, we might mean the engineers or programmers that are creating the technology. We might mean the business leaders that are uh, running the company. We might mean the users of the technology. and all of these people have some influence on the trajectory of uh, technology development, but I'm gonna try to convince you that none of them actually control it. So let's um, zero in on the other part of this question. Are we in control? What do we mean by control? Well, um, one simple answer might be, well, we can pull the plug, right? All these AIs are, uh, are uh, driven by electrically powered systems. And if we just pull the plug, then, uh, then we can shut them down. But can we really? I mean, do the thought experiment. What would happen today if we had to shut down all the computers on the planet? Um, do you think we would still be able to feed 8 billion people? Uh, what do you think would happen to our supply chains, our society, uh, our financial systems? I think if you if you think about it, uh, you know, just for a few seconds, you realize that uh, that is really not an option. Um, that would be a disastrous uh, event, probably far worse than any disease that could be wrought by these machines. So I think we're already well past the point of being able to pull the plug on the machines. Um, you might think, well, no, the AIs are just, you know, in, in niche applications, but, but they're actually not. They're central to the financial system. For example, our credit cards would stop working. Um, they depend very heavily on the fraud detection mechanisms that are being used. And uh, if those get shut down, uh, the credit card system is going to be very severely compromised. So it, these are not just niche applications. They have become central to the fabric of how our society works. So I think that that aspect of are we in control, the answer is clearly no. We're not going to be able to just pull the plug and shut these systems down. Um, so there's a different aspect of the question, are we in control? Well, you know, humans design these systems, maybe. Uh, the users choose to use them or choose not to use them. But is that really true? Uh, this is really the question that I'm going to focus on is whether the designers of the system are actually in control of the trajectory of the technology development and whether the users are actually able to choose whether to use the technology. So the question clarified, this would make it would have made much too long a title, but this is really the question that my that my talk is addressing. Do the engineers programming programmers, business leaders, or users determine the outcome of technology development? And the short answer is, I think that they influence technology development, but have far less control than most of us assume. So let's look at technology development from this perspective. So here's a picture of me um, standing in front of Vasa in the Vasa Museum in Stockholm. And uh, Vasa is a ship that was um, designed under orders from King Gustav II Adolf of Sweden uh, during uh, Swedish war with Poland. And uh, this ship was launched in 1628. And it had uh, about 200 people on board with you know, tremendous festivities, uh, launching a new class of ship and it, uh, went about a kilometer into the fjord 
in Sweden and a little bit of a breeze came up and it healed over and started taking in water on the lower uh, gun ports and it promptly sank. And uh, 30 of the 200 people on board were killed. Um, it sank in rather deep water and it was uh, resurfaced in the 1960s, remarkably preserved by the uh, low oxygen water in the, in the uh, in this fjord. But the question is, you know, this was clearly a bad boat design. So it's an engineered artifact and it was not well done. So I'd like to read you a quote from the French philosopher Alain, whose uh, real name was Emile Auguste Chartier, but he always, uh, uh, his nom de plume, so to speak, was Alain. So he said, every boat is copied from another boat. Let's reason as follows in the manner of Darwin. It's clear that a very badly made boat will end up at the bottom after one or two voyages and thus never be copied. In fact, uh, just as an aside, there were, uh, so King uh, Gustav II Adolf had ordered five of these boats to be built. And uh, the first one was launched. The other four were, were already in construction and they modified the design and didn't launch the other boats in, the, in their current form. Uh, but anyway, okay, so continuing with Alain, one could say then with complete rigor that it is the sea herself who fashions the boats, choosing those which function and destroying the others. So the question is, you know, in boat design, what is the role of the engineers who put together the, the design and how much control do they actually have? How much of their choice is actually determined by prior successes and failures versus their own top-down logical decision-making in the process of constructing designs? So my essential argument here is a uh, is an evolutionary argument that a lot of engineered design evolves and it evolves in a Darwinian way. And so uh, as soon as you start talking about uh, Darwinian evolution being um, uh, a governing force in some new domain, you have to of course go and read Richard Dawkins uh, whose famous book, The Blind Watchmaker, um, it had a number of very key contributions. Uh, one of them was, was really developing the idea that culture evolves in a Darwinian way, not just biology. <clears throat> but but it, on the biological side, one of Dawkins' agendas in writing this book was to debunk the religious creationist view, uh, and in particular to debunk the argument that the complexity of living systems mandates that they must have been designed and, and that if evolution can't come up with complex designs. And Dawkins makes a very, very strong argument that that is really not the case, that in fact, evolution is capable of creating far more complex designs than are, than are even remotely possible in a top-down uh, intelligent design style. So Dawkins is famous for for saying, you know, a chicken uh, is an egg's way of making another egg. So I'd like to pose a more modern version and less biological question, version of this question. So is a human a computer's way of making another computer? And I think if you're gonna take an evolutionary view of the development of technology, then there is a certain element of that going on. So, in my recent book called The Coevolution, I used the term digital creationism for the thesis that technology is the result of top down intelligent design. And um, I just quoting from that book, I say here, we, we don't like seeing our mental cognitive processes as themselves cogs in a relentless, purposeless evolution. But is that what they are? So, what is the role? of the designers of the technology and how much influence do they actually have on the development of the technology. So this idea of technology co-evolving with humans, I did not originate this idea. In fact, I first encountered it in this 2012 book uh, that I really recommend called Turing's Cathedral, written by the historian uh, George Dyson. And, um, and 
Dyson talks about Google's million plus servers as a collective metazoan organism, meaning a multicellular organism. And he points out that the companies and individuals who nurture the machines, okay, note, note the choice of language, are ever more richly rewarded in return. And he points out that unemployment is pandemic among those not working on behalf of the machines. Uh, quoting from his book, the big computer is doing everything in its power to make life as comfortable as possible for its human symbionts. Okay, this is an image that kind of blew my mind when I first read this, and it made me think of what, how the technology is functioning in our society in a, in a really completely new way. And so I started doing quite a bit of research into evolution uh, in, you know, as understood by evolutionary biologists, and I discovered that my own understanding of evolution was actually very naive. And um, I, I learned quite a bit. And some of that went into this book, Plato and the Nerd, where uh, reading from that book, if computers and software form organisms, then they depend on us for their procreation. We provide the husbandry and serve as midwives. In exchange, we depend on them to manage our systems of finance, commerce, and transportation. But more interestingly, the machines make the humans more effective at the very husbandry that spreads the software species. Okay, the machines are helping us help them in their development. The software survives and evolves only if the company survives and evolves and vice versa. So this evolutionary interpretation of what's going on, I think is perhaps has really been poorly understood, certainly by me. In fact, I, for my 40 year career, as an engineer, really had very much a top-down intelligent design perspective. Uh, and I have revised that perspective. So um, in my research on trying to understand evolution better, I read this another truly wonderful book by David Quammen called The Tangled Tree. And this book talks about very significant revisions that have occurred in our understanding of evolutionary processes since Darwin. And in fact, there's, you know, kind of Darwin's perspective, which we look back on it literally today, has a lot of uh, errors in it, things that we know are really not correct. And uh, a neo-Darwinian view came along that was a little more defensible, but it turned out not to be effective enough at predicting certain uh, evolutionary phenomena, like the rapidity with the uh with which antibiotic resistant bacteria form um it, it turns out that the neo-darwinian view doesn't uh doesn't even come close to being able to predict uh that kind of evolutionary phenomenon that we see happening in uh all around us it also fails to predict certain bursts of rapid biological evolution such as the cambrian explosion so this happened about uh, half a billion years ago, and um, it there was a very rapid emergence of a very large number of metazoan species, multicellular organisms, over a relatively short period of time, about 20 million years. And um, Andrew Parker, uh, in his 2003 book that's called In the Blink of an Eye, uh, postulated a theory for how this uh, Cambrian explosion came about. And he said it was a runaway feedback loop that started with the development of eyesight. That was, which start, it started in very simple ways, cells that just are able to react to um, uh, optical stimulus. Um, but he pointed out that this enabled predation. And as soon as you have predation, you have uh, organisms that are killing off other organisms, and that uh, created, creates a competition between organisms that accelerates evolution. So the, the organisms themselves cause an acceleration through a feedback loop, and you get this runaway effect that 
leads to a very quick development, relatively quick development of, um, of um, many new kinds of organisms. I think this kind of feedback loop is very much what we're seeing in technology today, that the technology itself is accelerating the development of the technology. So there's other aspects of, of, uh, of evolution that I, that were completely new to me. So uh, for example, uh, Joshua Laterman, who was uh, 26 years old when, when he uh, discovered this phenomenon that's called horizontal gene transfer. And um, he later got the Nobel prize at age 33 for this work. But what this, what this shows is that in fact, I used to think, and in fact, the neo-Darwinian view of evolution is that mutations occur randomly. So you have random effects where a uh, alpha particle hits a uh, DNA molecule and, and mutates it, uh, or a chemical in the environment causes a, a mutation in the DNA, and that some of those mutations are beneficial and therefore those survive. Well, it, that particular mechanism, uh, if you construct a statistical model of how it would work, uh, falls orders of magnitude short in being able to predict rapid evolution that we actually see in the field, such as the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So um, Laterman's uh, thesis here is that in fact, the organisms themselves are accelerating the evolution. And he identified this method uh, called horizontal gene transfer where a uh, bacteriophage, which is a virus that attacks bacteria, uh, it invades a cell, it, it uh, hijacks the cell's uh, mechanisms for uh, reproducing itself and uses those to create a whole bunch of new, bacteria, uh, new viruses. But the viruses then kill the cell, the cell explodes, and they spread into the environment, but they're, it, it's messy and they're carrying pieces of the DNA from the bacteria. Then they go and attempt to invade another cell and maybe fail to kill that one, but they actually splice into that one's DNA, chunks of the DNA from the previous bacteria that they did successfully kill. And so they have now mutated the bacteria. Um, and this kind of mutation, it turns out that you can construct a different kind of statistical model and it leads to a much more rapid uh, evolution of the of the bacteria. So in technology, do we have something analogous? Well, think about a programmer. Uh, you know, I, I have been writing programs my entire career. And I used to think that every program that I wrote was the result of top down intelligent design that I was making conscious decisions about what should go into that program and what it should look like. I now know that it's not true. No program gets written starting from a blank slate and writing text on a, uh, on a blank screen. Uh, we pull in chunks of code from all over the place. We're, our thinking when we write a program is hugely affected by the design of the programming language that we're using and by the tools that we're using. So is it maybe more appropriate to think of the software engineer as functioning a bit like a virus here, taking chunks of what I call codome, um, chunks of the software's version of DNA and splicing those together to create new codomes. And many of those programs that we create this way simply fail in the environment. Uh, most of the code that I've written in my career um, simply died on a shelf because it just never took off. Um, but on the other hand, you know, some of the programs that get created this way succeed in, in the environment and proceed to become uh, an integral part of our culture. So this is a different kind of mechanism than the usual view of top-down intelligent design. So let's look at it from a different perspective. So Recently, we humans have learned to edit our own genes. We can do that. So by analogy, can computers do that? Can we teach computers to write programs? Well, 
we're doing that actually. There's a lot of research projects where the computers are actually getting eh, still not that great, but they're uh, starting to do some fairly incredible things. But actually, there's a, me a mechanism where the computers aren't really just autonomously writing programs, but the computers are teaching humans to write programs. So the question, can computers teach humans to write programs is maybe the more pertinent question today. And I argue that they're already doing that. They do this big time. And you know, I, I have the benefit of, I've been writing programs for more than 40 years and my productivity writing software is orders of magnitude higher than it was 40 years ago. Um, and that's because of the, the tools, which are all pieces of software. The programming languages are far better. Uh, the tools that we use to seek out information about what we're trying to write, uh, to put together pieces of code that other people have written. These, these tools have gotten fabulously better than they, than they used to be. And it's really, the computers here are actually teaching me to write programs more effectively. So there's this feedback loop here. It's, it's really a symbi symbiotic coevolution in this case. So in uh, quoting from my Plato and the Nerd uh, book, you know, I say there, are, are we playing God, creating a new life form in our own image? Or are we being played by a Darwinian evolution of a symbiotic new species? Are humans the purveyors of a noisy channel of mutation, facilitating sex between software beings by recombining and mutating programs into new ones? This is kind of like animal husbandry, right? Uh, it's more like animal husbandry than it is like top-down intelligent design. So going back to this question, right? Do the engineers, programmers, or business leaders, or users determine the outcome of technology development? Well, uh, my conclusion here is that if you look at the first three of these, the engineers, the programmers, and the business leaders, um, they don't determine the outcome of technology development. They do influence it. They nudge it in various directions, but they don't determine it. What about the users, right? Um, users are part of the ecosystem within which the survival of the fittest is gonna determine which technologies win. So are the users in control? In fact, if you go back to Alain's quote, he sort of seems to want to imply that. Right um, when he when he says one could say with complete rigor that it is the sea herself who fashions the boats, choosing those those which function and destroying the others, that suggests that you know the real designers of Snapchat are teenagers rather than software engineers. Um, the users are the designers because they selected Snapchat over the other thousands of uh, comp of competing. Uh, chat mechanisms that were out there. But that's, I think, an overstatement. And I think that in any feedback loop, every part of the feedback loop is, in a sense, equally important because you take any piece of the feedback loop out and it breaks the loop and you, you, it becomes an open loop system, okay? So I think that this is an overstatement that the C is actually designing these ships. It's more like a, a feedback loop where the sea has an influence and these ship designers have uh, an influence, but neither of them is in a position to control and determine. Moreover, in this feedback loop, we shouldn't underestimate the fact that machines actually manipulate their users. There's two very nice articles in this uh, Perspectives on Digital Humanism book, uh, which I really recommend reading that specifically address this issue of machines manipulating their users. And let me point out that this is actually not avoidable. Machines will manipulate their users and the manipulation of users is only going to accelerate, all right? And I, my claim is that um, right today, the amount of information that's available to all of us vastly exceeds our ability to absorb it. And you know, people tend to focus, for example, on the fake news problem, right? The information that's out there that is actually not true information. Forget about the false information. Let's just think about the true information. There is way too much true information out there for any of us to absorb it. It's an information flood. And 
the, today what's happening is, is that all of our sources of information are being mediated, most of them by AIs. I was really disheartened. I, I subscribed to uh, the New York Times and I was really disheartened when they switched a few years ago to customizing my feed. It's no, it's no longer possible to go to the New York Times website and find the front page of the New York Times. In order to do that, you have to get the print edition delivered to you. And that's the only way that you can be sure that the information has not been customized for you. In fact, I still get a print edition of the San Francisco Chronicle precisely because I know that that particular information flow is not being customized to me for me individually. Um, but the reality is that most of the information that is fed to all of us these days is in fact being mediated by AIs and that this is both necessary and inevitable. Um, there's too much information out there and we simply can't absorb it all. And so what's gonna happen? Well, it's going to have to be fed to us by machines and those machines are inevitably the ones that the mechanisms for disseminating information that succeed are going to be the ones that most effectively customize our information flows. And I think that this is simply a, a consequence of an evolutionary process. So the information economy naturally leads the AIs to filter in a way that manipulates the humans. So human decision-making is actually no longer independent of the machines because our information flows are being customized by the machines. So if we look at the, what, what the machines are actually doing to customize this information, well, um, if you look at the primary advertisement driven mechanisms that you find on, for example, on Facebook. Um, so Stuart Russell um, points out, my colleague Stuart Russell, who is a professor at Berkeley, that predictable humans can be reliably presented with advertisements they will click on. Okay, if you can, if you have a predictable person, uh, they will um, be more likely to be able to, you'll be more likely to be able to choose an ad, present it to them, and they will click on it. He points out that political extremists are more predictable than moderates. And there's this feedback loop that naturally emerges where the machines make you more predictable so that their predictions are more accurate. And they do this by feeding you customized information. So in my coevolution book, I, I use the term an information apocalypse for, for this because completely separate from the fake news problem, just focus on true information. As soon as you have these highly customized information feeds, you can end up with islands of disjoint truths where you have people who have a set of truths trying to interact with other people who have a completely non-overlapping set of truths for this to be a problem. They can be true information and it creates a, a, a huge problem for society uh, when you have these islands of disjoint truths. So the choice of the term uh, apocalypse is, is very carefully done because apocalypse means a revealing of information actually. So um, at its root. So in my studies of uh, biological evolution, I also learned about another mechanism which was really uh, brought to the foreground. Um, it's an evolutionary theory that was actually first articulated by the Russian botanist uh, Konstantin Marischalsky. Um, but Marischalsky didn't really develop it as a credible scientific theory. And, and he was actually regarded by most botanists at the time as a bit of a flake. It was really Lynn Margulis uh, in the 1960s who gave this a firm biological footing. But the idea here is that um, the kinds of cells uh, that we have in our bodies and that all plants and animals have, which are, um, uh, you know, they're, they have organelles in them, unlike bacterial cells. So pro, uh, prokaryotic cells are the kind of cells that bacteria have, which don't have nuclei, don't have mitochondria. 
uh, versus the cells that we have in our body, which are eukaryotic cells, which have these organelles in them. And this endosymbiotic theory is that these kinds of cells came about through a symbiosis, that instead of digesting a bacteria, you had a, a bacteria ingest another and integrate it into its system. And that that integration turned out to be useful and as a consequence, able to survive and reproduce in an environment. And so this endosymbiotic theory is that uh, much of the development of multicellular organisms came about through symbiosis, not through mutation, okay? That's an important distinction. You think of random mutation leading to some new variant of an organism. No, no, no. This is about two organisms joining forces. So a key question is that what humans are doing with technology now? Are we in fact joining forces with technology and becoming effectively cyborgs? So this is a picture of my own Apple watch, which um, I actually don't wear the watch anymore because I find it pretty annoying to have to recharge it every day. But um, when I was wearing it, it would be reminding me, you know, every couple of hours that I needed to breathe. Uh, it's like the watch was trying to make sure that to keep me alive in case, you know, I would forget to breathe because if I, if I die because this watch failed to remind me to breathe, then I'm not going to propagate. I'm not going to do anything to propagate the watch species. So <laughs> that's sort of a cartoon, right? But it, it, in much deeper ways, technology has become a part of us, a very big part of us. And this is not a new thing. So uh, the, the tablets at the lower left here are Sumerian writing from about, um, from, from about 2300 uh, uh, before the common era. So, so 5,000 years ago. And this was really the first uh, development of writing systems in uh, human history, as far as we know. And it enabled the development of societies that were larger than just a few dozen people. Without writing systems, that really wasn't viable. You didn't have mechanisms for record keeping, for keeping track of debts and so forth. Uh, it turns out that when they finally decoded these tablets, what they had written on them was really pretty boring. It was, for the most part, it was not poetry. It was things like um, a record of debts. Um, so-and-so owed so many, so-and-so, so many goats, for example. And writing systems have become very much a part of our thinking, an extension of our thinking. Uh, I mean, if you, if you do math, for example, you know, it's really quite difficult to do math just in your head. Uh, it's hard to do anything non-trivial. You need paper and pencil to be able to do it. And the paper and pencil are not just external devices. They're actually part of your thinking. They become part of your cognitive process. They become an intellectual prosthesis. And the technology has become that for us as well. It affects our thinking. It is part of our thinking. It's not just an outside thing that we're interacting with. So Richard Dawkins talked uh, about in this book, The Selfish Gene is where he introduced the, the term meme for the unit of replication in culture. I'd like to emphasize that technology is different from this because a meme exists only in a human mind. It doesn't have an autonomous agency of its own, but our computers do, okay? They are able to function for at least a reasonable amount of time without particular help from humans and their existence and their processes are autonomous from the processes going on in the human body which is not true of memes, okay? Memes cease to exist when the humans disappear. Um, but it's not clear that that will be true of the AIs. So uh, I was very affected by another wonderful book that I recommend written by David Sloan Wilson, which is uh, this book called Evolution for Everyone. And um, David Sloan Wilson identifies himself as an evolutionist. He takes an evolutionary interpretation of a large number of phenomena 
uh, economics, sociology, science, and mathematics. He, he thinks of as, as evolving rather than being discovered. We, we, we have this sort of, I think, what is, is now to me a very old fashioned view of, of science, that it's all about discovering this, these truths that are hidden in some platonic universe and we discover them. No, I, I think actually uh, they evolve in very much a Darwinian kind of way, similar to the memes of uh, Richard Dawkins. So um, these two uh, Chilean scientists, Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, coined a term that I think is very useful when thinking about what has happened to technology in the last uh, very few years. This term is autopoiesis. And the auto is of course, the self-referential aspect. Poesis is the same root, root as the word for poetry. And the, the meaning of this term is that life is about self-sustaining and reproducing processes. Okay, self-sustaining and reproducing processes. Software is becoming that, self-sustaining and reproducing. In fact, it's not clear whether it's completely there now, it's very dependent still on humans, Okay, and I believe it will actually remain very dependent on humans for a long time in a kind of symbiotic feedback loop. But, um, but it has very strong elements of this self-sustaining and reproducing processes. So as the machines and the software increasingly design and maintain themselves, you know, are they developing this autopoiesis? That's a, that's a, a key question. So let me close by turning back to this question of accountability. So who is the artist on this? So this particular uh, artwork, which um, is called a uh, portrait of, uh, uh, let's see, I've forgotten, a uh, portrait of Edmond de Bellamy, okay? And it was created by an artist collective, three guys who call themselves obvious. And Pierre Fautrel is shown in the picture here. He's one of the, one of the three. So who created this painting? Um, well, let me tell you a little bit about how this painting came about. Well, first of all, I want to point out that they sold this painting on at the auction house Christie's um, in 2018 for uh, $430 million, uh, $430,000. Um, it was an extraordinary surprise to everyone concerned. Uh, Christie's estimated that it might go for eight to 10,000. Um, the the uh, creators at, well, the people at Obvious insist that they're not the creators, that in fact, they positioned this as the world's first AI created artwork. And that's what was sold, was the first, world's first AI created artwork. Well, how, how did it come about? Well, it was created using a technique called gener generative adversarial networks that is due to this fellow, Ian Goodfellow. Um, so it, the painting is called Portrait de Bellamy. Bellamy means kind of good friend in French. And so the name of the portrait is, I think, a tribute to Ian Goodfellow, uh, who is the father of generative adversarial networks, okay? So Goodfellow developed the technique that was used to train the AI to be able to create this portrait. And, it, and he was reacting to prior attempts at AI generated synthetic images. So here's one of the prior attempts from, from Deep Dream, a project at Google, where they turned around an, an AI that had been trained to recognize dog images, images with dogs. And they reversed the training algorithm where instead of adjusting the weights of the AI um, using the back propagation algorithm, they adjusted the pixels of the image using the same back propagation uh, algorithm. And as a consequence, what the AI does is try to generate an image that it will itself regard as very dog-like. So it synthesizes a dog-like image that will for this particular AI, very much represent dogs, but it comes up with things that most humans would not call dogs. These are nightmares, right? So, 
anyway, the uh, Ian Goodfellow was reacting to those ineffective techniques at generating realistic images and created a technique that it was actually much better at it. And then a high school student, Robbie Barrett, uh, who then went on to, to be a Stanford student, that's where he went to college. But um, anyway, when he was in high school, he wrote a, an implementation of generative adversarial networks and published it as open source software on GitHub. And these three French guys simply downloaded his software and pointed it at a bunch of portrait images that they were able to uh, find online and trained it to synthesize portraits. Robbie Barrett himself had, has created some very striking uh, artworks himself um, using his own software. And so, but the question then is, well, who, who's the creator here of this uh, portrait of uh, Edmond de Bellamy? Um, so one argument, I guess, that you could make is that these three French guys kind of found this portrait in a synthesis that was of probably, you know, they, they probably had the AI generate thousands of portraits and they picked one that they liked. And so they declared that to be an artwork. Um, maybe that's a found object. There's a long tradition in art for artists um, to take found objects. And one of the more famous ones is Marcel Duchamp's fountain from 1917, which is shown right here. Um, you know, who's the creator of that artwork? Well, Marcel Duchamp, it's a piece of conceptual art. And maybe the conceptual art work here was the idea of the world's first AI created artwork. Maybe that's what was bought at Christie's for, for $430,000 is, was a piece of conceptual art rather than a piece of AI created art. It's really becomes much more complicated to associate, um, uh, to attribute um, uh, responsibility or credit. Uh, is it the AI? Is it the artist? Is it, is it the feedback loop? Is it the whole system? Um, so uh, Margaret Bowden uh, has a, a very nice widely cited article that kind of analyzes this question of creativity in AI. And um, she really presents AI as a better paintbrush, that it's a technique that humans use to create compelling images um, and it takes ideas and puts them together in ways that are novel and, uh, and, and so forth. And so that's, I think, a reasonable interpretation of what these things are doing. So on this question of attribution, you know, when we, I think we have a tendency to jump to simple answers. And so when we look at problems that emerged like in 2016 with the, with the election and the Brexit situation where you know, clearly the machines were being used to manipulate people, maybe we could, should just blame Mark Zuckerberg for this. And I think that we should resist the temptation to oversimplify this way. I mean, I certainly think that Mark Zuckerberg had a lot of influence on the emergence of pathological behaviors in these machines, um, but it's too simple to just pin the responsibility on any one individual. So the conclusion is that I believe technology is co-evolving with humans. I believe that this form of evolution is new. It's not biological, that's obvious. It's not, it doesn't involve genes, but it's also not just cultural. It doesn't, it involves more than memes because the machines themselves have an autonomy. They're developing a form of autopoiesis. They operate continuously in an environment and operate with help from humans, but it's more like a symbiosis with humans than it is like they're operating under the direction of humans. So I think this is the perspective that I wanted to share with you and uh, I'll open up for discussion now. Anyone still there? Robert, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, but you can't see me. I cannot see you, no. At least you know how I look like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, there are several questions in the audience. I start in the first row. Thank you very much for this uh, teaching in social, digital social darwinism. 
Five. Uh, my conclusion is a bit that uh, um, maybe it's oversimplifying, but uh, the, that is maybe due to a very US American pattern of thinking uh, the social Darwinism that the social life should uh, be uh, should, should work as biological uh, uh, evolution as well as in China. You see that uh, they will develop the they will think that the development of the digital world should use as a technology for authoritarianism. But I think we have a third option in Europe, especially in Vienna, where we think that technology and things that everybody needs should not uh, just be developed, developed uh, by the strongest and the richest and by the idea of making most profit, but uh, should be uh, commons and that uh, one of them, the thing you did not mention at all is that there are not machines and humans, but there are big companies who are uh, organizing this and who are giving the, um, the aids for the machines to work. And uh, I think I already disagree with your first assumption that the, the thing we should uh, aim at is a world where all the 8 billion people decide together what this world is going to and not some elite in the United States which have uh, some uh, progress in developing things. Yeah. You, uh, so you, this was a fundamental remark. Yeah, you, you raised some very good points. Let me let me react to a couple of them. Um, I I think that one result of this coevolutionary interpretation is in fact that we should be thinking about regulating technology and figuring out ways to regulate. Regulation is is distinct from top-down intelligent design, right? It's a way of nudging the, the direction in which technology develops. And I think that the experiments happening in Europe are a very positive force uh, on what, uh, and you know, they're not, that sometimes the, the results are disappointing. I think that the GDPR, for example, uh, has had limited effects, uh, but one effect that it has had is that it makes it very clear to anyone who goes online these days just how much they're being tracked. Uh, because one of the goals of the GDPR was in fact to uh, provide transparency about this kind of tracking that, that before the GDPR was going out on in the background without any informed consent. Um, so I think that these are uh, necessary things. And what I think is also important is that, you know, sometimes, one of the other oversimplifications you hear a lot is that, well, we should just teach all the engineers ethics. And if we can get all the engineers to act ethically, then bad things won't happen. I think that's a, an absurd oversimplification. And I think that if you understand this coevolutionary process, you, you will realize that that's an oversimplification. Of course, we want people to behave ethically, but it's also going to be true regardless. We are human beings after all that some people will not behave ethically. And um, it doesn't matter really uh, how much you teach the ones, uh, you know, some subset uh, about ethics, the technologies that will survive are the ones that will survive for Darwinian reasons, not for ethical reasons. So the regulation needs to be a very big part of the story in order to counter the potential effects from unethical actions. So um, the other thing is you mentioned the profit motive as being one of the potential problems. I don't think that's an effective way to think about it because I think if you, if you think about a co-evolution, right? If you have a symbiotic relationship, a symbiosis has to work both ways, right? And so to, to use, uh, uh, let me read from Dyson again from uh, his Turing's Cathedral, right? Um, he says, he points out that the companies and individuals who nurture the servers are ever more richly rewarded in return, okay? Um, even if you have a nonprofit like Wikipedia, for example, in order for Wikipedia to survive, the, the Wikimedia Foundation, it has to 
pay employees. Okay, it's going to need some revenue. The, the symbiosis doesn't work if you're missing one of the elements of the symbiosis. And if you can't get software engineers to work on, on Wikipedia, Wikipedia will die. Okay, um, the profit motive is not the issue. The issue is that a symbiosis requires humans to be supported in the process of developing uh, the technology. And uh, therefore, you know, it's, there's got to be some um, remuneration to the individuals who are uh, um, developing the technology. And in, but more importantly, the technology that develops will be the technology that remunerates the symbiotic humans because that's the Darwinian force, okay? So I think that um, one way to think of the profit motive is that it's a mechanism by which the machines are influencing the humans, okay? In order, the machines are creating things that generate profit, which then captures the greedy intentions of the humans and gets the humans to do the machines bidding. All right. Now that's too much of a teleological approach. I, I think you want to think of this more as a co-evolution, uh, but it's uh, it's you know kind of an extreme point to make the point that I think that blaming this all on the profit motive I think is is misunderstanding the problem. Okay, but we have we are running out of time. We have many more questions. We have two now. Two short questions and two short answers, please. So it's you and then from the lead. I thought you were giving me two, John, two questions. But no, 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 you have two. No, okay, one well, comment. Uh, just, uh, so thank you for that. That was, I, I think I need to reflect a little bit more on whether I completely write the, the full evolution narrative. On the other hand, well, for, for one reason is that I think that maybe machines don't have the intent that we normally associate. With, with, with human evolution, but let, let, let's put that to one side. I think um, there are good examples of how, for example, mutation has been used in say software engineering to generate test cases, for example, the mutation testing is, is one example. But I suppose that my question is though, taking a, an engineering perspective on this, could this all be explained by the engineering dichotomy between what's what Vincenti calls um, radical and normal engineering. So normal engineering is building systems you understand and radical engineering is building or designing systems that perhaps you don't understand and failure is built into it. And Petrovsky has got a whole line of research where you learn from failure, for example. So, and I'm just wondering whether everything you've just described in terms of systems failing and people learning from it could also be explained with, a, with an engineering narrative rather than a scientific one of, as evolution as an alternative to what you just described. Um, I, I think that, that that's a very good point. I, I want to make one comment about, you, you mentioned briefly the evolutionary software uh, development. There's a, been a field of research for some time to, to use uh, uh, evolution as a way to develop software. And it's proved pretty ineffective um, compared to uh, more standard techniques. And I think one of the reasons for that is that it actually misunderstands evolution. It's using the neo-Darwinian style of evolution, which is random mutation followed by natural selection. And I think that what I've learned about biological evolution is that it's a lot less random than I used to think. And so if you think instead of the software engineer as being this, the source of the mutation, uh, that's, that is a lot less random. And I think you get uh, more effective techniques uh, in that way. So I just wanted to comment about that aspect of it. The engineering versus... No, 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 I'm sorry. I'll be very brief. So two things. First of all, thank you for the very rich uh, presentation. And uh, the thing you said about technology kind of being in a symbiosis with us reminded me of something that Yuval Harari, a um, historian from Israel already proposed about wheat. He, he actually said 10,000 years ago, wheat was just a wild grass somewhere in the Middle East. Now it's growing all over the place, everywhere. We're cultivating it, we're running on it. Our society is based on wheat. But have we domesticated wheat? 
or has the wheat actually domesticated us? It's kind of the same thing that, that you said. Um, and secondly, a personal question, more or less, um, I'm in the process of um, applying for a research study at Berkeley, and I'm still looking. <laughs> I'm still looking for someone to, to sponsor my day. Uh, it's only on the, by the Australian uh, Marshall Plant Foundation, but I just need some professor to say yes. Yeah. Very good student, and you can come. Before you answer that, I'm going to exchange your emails and then you can communicate directly with this. Viennese approach, how to and research. Yeah. And yeah, so by all means, send send me an email. And um, I I also I love Yuval Noah Harari's books. Uh, I've read everything he's written. Um, fantastic books. Uh, he's he's just brilliant in his insight into um, what's going on. Edward, thank you. You will miss the evening, and you will miss the Wednesday evening at the Art House. You know what you miss. Um, yeah. It's not evolutionary, it's just in this room. I thank you very much. And yeah, we are going to the market. Have a nice day. All right. Thank you all.